love. There's a love that lives in me. For you, Lord, my Savior King, breaks the sin that's binding, leads me to we just worship you in this place today we exalt you higher than anything else in our lives for you are worthy of all our praise and today we praise you you are worthy of our worship and today we we show what you are worth by laying our very lives before you. Everything that we are, everything that we have, everything that we represent, everything that we hope to be, all of our plans, all of our dreams, we lay everything before your throne today. That is our act of worship. An act of complete and total surrender and submission. That you are God upon your throne and we worship you in all of your glory in all of your majesty Lord, as we are in your presence today, I pray that if there are those here in this shelter and those who are joining joining us online, Father, I pray that if there is a need in their life, I pray that today you would show yourself mighty. Show yourself victorious. 
in our lives. Show yourself to be the great healer. Show yourself to be the great provider. Show yourself to be the great deliverer. May you meet each need. And may today, may it just start with just a spark of faith. That you would just let us know that we know that you are going to take care of us. That we don't have to worry. That we can put our trust completely in you. And that you will be our great God. And you will see us through every single day of our life. Until that day. When we lay this life down and step into your presence. Or maybe we meet you in the clouds. Father, let your will be done on this earth, in our lives, in our church, as your will is being done in heaven. And we thank you. And we give you praise. And I ask all of this in the mighty name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. God bless you. You may be seated. Thank you, Christy. As you know, we're still not passing an offering plate, so you can see the yellow uh, buddy barrel there. Uh, even though it's a buddy barrel, it's not, it's not just BGMC, so I know we get used to that, but uh, it's just our collection bucket. So there's some offering envelopes there and some uh, sealed for your protection bags, and uh, uh, they're, they're there for you. So if you want to give today, you can do that after the service on your, on your way out of the pavilion. Uh, just one real quick uh, announcement. Um, uh, well, actually two. The first one is, is that this week, for those of you with kids or grandkids, uh, we have connected with a group that is doing an online VBS. It is some of the top children's evangelists across the nation uh, who have come together and created this. It's called Wow VBS. And uh, so we are going to be, all, each day I'll be posting to the church page uh, a link to that. You have to watch it live in the evening. Uh, it is not something that is recorded and played later. It is a one and done event. Uh, so if you miss a night, you miss a night. But uh, we do want to make that available uh, since we're not able to have our own VBS this year uh, and it will be good quality stuff. I've seen a little bit of the promo stuff for it and it looks like it's going to be really good so we'll post that. Uh, the other thing is is that next week we will be right back here uh, in the park. This Thursday night we will be having a board meeting and this we will be making uh, we'll, we'll be looking at the next couple weeks, probably no further than that to see what we're going to either continue here or be moving into the church uh, and uh, we'll be having those those discussions and seeing kind of where we're at with that so that way we can next week be able to tell you where we're going after that. But next week for 4th of July weekend, we will be right here in the park. Alright? So that's where that's at. Alright! If you got your Bibles, uh, get them out and get them ready uh, because we're going to continue our series of God Never Said That. Uh, it is important that we know what the Word of God says. Thank you, Rodney. It is important for all of us to know what the Word of God says. Amen. amen. That's a great place for an amen. I know that you don't have to type it in anymore, okay? You can actually say it out loud. Okay, so let's just all practice that together, okay? Amen. 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 
Oh, see, that's good. We can do it. Thank you, Gary, for leading out on that. All right. Keep your voice strong. All right. So in this series, we, we are, we, we've got this week and next week. I don't know what I'm going to do. I've got actually one more week that I know I'm going to do in this series, but I may actually pause next week since it's the 4th of July, uh, and I may do something just a little bit different, um, uh, something that I have just maybe struggled with during this whole pandemic pandemic thing uh, that I, 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 I may address, and I, I may not be brave enough to address it. I don't know. Uh, but uh, we'll just have to see. So you'll, you'll come and find out. If I'm preaching on God never said that last week, I'm chicken. All right? Um, but uh, it's just something that God has laid on my heart, and uh, we, we will just see if, if God can give me the words to, to figure that out. So you're not going to want to miss that unless I don't do it. All right? Thank you. That's my humor right there. If you didn't, don't know that. All right. So in week one, we looked at some things that God that God uh, doesn't say. Okay. The first one was God wants me happy. That is a philosophy of our world today. Uh, you can find that on every different kind of social media there is. If you type in anything that you show that you're unhappy with life, you will get a thousand responses of people saying, Honey, you should just do what makes you happy. As if somehow God said, This is what it's all about. You should be happy. God never said that. If you missed that week, you need to go back. Uh, week two, we talked about the, the phrase, God will never give you more than you can handle. We, we hear that. Sometimes as Christians, we will say that to another individual who's going through a tough time. Can I tell you, God never said that. If you missed that week, you need to really go back because you, that, that is something that we see and hear all the time and you need to know how to address it biblically. That's why it's important that we know what the book says. Uh, so make sure you know that one. Week three, we looked at you don't have to love all people. Now we're going to love people who love us, but boy, it can be, it can be hard to love all people. Because when we say all people, we know exactly who we're talking about, don't we? The person that is unlovable in our life, okay, that person that we struggle with, maybe it's a person we've never even met, but it's that type of person. Well, God never said that we didn't have to love all people. If you missed that week, you need to go back. Week four, uh, you don't have to forgive those that hurt you. Tied in very well with the third week. If you don't have to love them and you don't have to forgive them. God never said those things. Those are all things that we struggle with, uh, I believe, as at being American Christians. Um, and so today we're going to continue to look at our American culture because that's where we live. Okay, in this cultural belief that really says this, it doesn't matter what I do. It's none of your business. It's none of your business what I do. I can do what, as long as I'm not hurting you, it's none of your business what I'm doing. Okay? And can I tell you that sometimes we want to just say, I can do whatever I want and it really doesn't matter. As if somehow we have found that in this book. Wow, look at this. Right here in, in Genesis chapter 50, it says, I can do whatever I want, and it doesn't matter. God never said that. Today, we're going to dive into Scripture, uh, and we're going to talk about what He has to say about our behavior and I want to encourage you. Uh, one of the things that I've noticed uh, when I was at home sitting on my couch watching along with you, uh, because if you didn't know, uh, we recorded the services on Thursday or Friday and then spent eight hours editing that and getting that online. Uh, so, and then we spent probably the same amount of time uploading it so it would be there on Facebook and YouTube. So Sunday morning, I'm sitting on my couch, probably the same as you, watching. And one of the things I noticed is I, I didn't see everybody who's there. 
Only my Facebook friends do I see. Robbie only sees her Facebook friends. Angela only sees her Facebook. So there's lots of people that may be there that we just have no idea. There's nothing that tells us who's all there. We have no idea. But we watch that little number. That little number is a curse to preachers. Oh my. You know that little number I'm talking about if you watch online that tells how many are in that little room watching? You know, I, you, I can count up the people that said, Caleb Ruby just entered the room. The Sashes just entered the room. Robbie Keck entered the room. Oh. Now, I don't know if Angel ever entered the room. The Tillmans entered the room. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. So she was there with the bulletin every week. So she was, she was there. Okay, but, but if you added all of those things up, there would be close to 100 people who my Facebook would say entered the room. Yet the number was always somewhere between 35 and 50. Always. So do you know what that means? That's drive-by church right there. Okay? You know what drive-by church is on Facebook? It means this. You go to Facebook knowing that you're Pastor John's friend. You step into the room. John Keck is here. And everybody that's your friend sees that, it doesn't say you left the room. So you just go back out of the room and you can continue with your Facebook, uh, whatever you do on Facebook. Never having to come back into the room. So today I'm going to encourage those who are watching online, you need to stay to the end. You need to hear this. Those of you, you have no choice unless you get sick. Okay? If you get sick, you leave. But, but I want you to stay to the end of this. Uh, I want you to hear to the end of this. Um, because I think you have to put it all together. Uh, and part of that is, is because for anybody to share this message, you have to understand that we are all flawed individuals. We are all sinners saved by grace. And so we need to see the whole picture. You need to hear the whole story as we go through this. So we're going to start today and we're going to look at a little bit of history. Okay, you know that I like history. So we're going to go back to biblical days because I like biblical history uh, as well as current history. Uh, but if you go back to biblical history and you go to that first century uh, where the church has just started, uh, Jesus was alive during the first century, okay, that was kind of the thing that started the first century. If you don't know that, our time is divided by the life of Christ. Now in the last 20 years, uh, uh, people who don't believe in God have tried to change the meaning of all of that. But truly, time was divided uh, by the birth of Christ. But in biblical days, probably the greatest cultural value of their day was justice. I could probably take you to Scripture. I feel like I could, I, I, I don't know that I could 100% convince you of that, but I feel like I could make a good case for that. An eye for an eye. A tooth for a tooth. Okay? We want justice. You do something wrong, you should be punished. Now, I can tell you that that is still one of our, our values today. Though I don't believe it is the greatest cultural value that we have. Now, we, we go through times in our country uh, where people scream out for justice. We are, we're living through some of that right now. Okay, But I truly believe that for us right now, the greatest cultural value uh, that our society looks at is, and says this is, this is what we value more than anything is the word tolerance. I want to talk about the word tolerance in history for a moment because when I was in grade school, I was introduced to the word tolerance. Okay? And it literally meant this. All people have equal value. Now, I was born in the 60s, was in grade school in the late 60s and 70s. So we know where our country was at with that, with a lot of the society things going on. And so for that word to come out and to say all people have equal value was almost like a new concept. It shouldn't have been in church world. It shouldn't have been. That, that should have always been a part of church world from the first century. However, the church has struggled with this in our history. Okay, we have to be honest with that. 
Okay? So tolerance was really, as it was introduced, was a good thing. Oh, we've gone through American history. We, you know, slavery is over. Civil rights was, was on the forefront of everything. And it was something that came along that really needed to be taught. And so they began to teach in school, when I was a kid, of tolerance. That all people have equal value. I truly believe that is a value that should still be taught uh, to, to everyone. And if people struggle with that, uh, they really need to, to, to embrace that. As followers of Christ, we should be leading the way in accepting, embracing, and loving all people. Period. There's no exceptions to this. Not an exception for race, ethnicity, um, the country that you were born in, your social status, your economic status, your gender or sex, not even your political position. Okay? There should be no, no reason for us as believers to, to disagree or hate. We can disagree, I guess. But to hate another individual. However, in my lifetime... I've watched what has happened to the word tolerance. And it has continued to change. And even before I got out of school, and definitely by the time that I was in college, the word tolerance had gone from all people to all ideas and beliefs and behavior are of equal value. And it goes something like this. You know, we've watched in, in, in my lifetime that all ideas and beliefs have equal value. That you can believe whatever you want. That's your truth. I can believe whatever I want. That's my truth. And we must be tolerant of each other because nobody has to be wrong. Nobody. There's no absolute truth. Okay? Which means if there's no absolute truth, you can't have the, the Bible. Because the Bible is God's absolute truth to us. So you have a whole culture coming along and saying you need to be tolerant of everybody else's ideas and beliefs because nobody can be told that they are wrong. Everybody has to be right because that is their truth. And so with this definition of tolerance, we have to accept each other's truth. Okay? No one can be wrong. You can't tell another individual, you are wrong. That is taboo in our society. Okay? Um, well, unless you're speaking to Christians, then, then you can tell a Christian that they're wrong. Okay? You hear me? Okay? So, even if somebody is 100% wrong, it is not acceptable for us to tell somebody that is wrong. That's just the way our society has changed. That's why tolerance has become so acceptable. Okay? I've also watched in my lifetime that all behavior has become of equal value so that we can do whatever we want and it's okay Okay, and sometimes we say, well, it's okay because it's my right, or it's okay because this is what I believe to be right, and I can just do whatever, or I want to do this because it feels right. It feels good to me, so therefore it must be right for me. And so with this definition of tolerance, we must accept each other's behavior because for what they are doing, it's okay for them. Now, it's not acceptable in our culture to say that someone else's behavior is wrong unless it's a really, really, really bad thing. Okay? It's true. Most of us will say that murder is wrong, but we are finding out in our society that sometimes murder is called wrong and sometimes it seems to be called, well... It's okay. We're, we've seen this in, in the news in the last six weeks. Okay? It's okay to, to, you know, it's not okay to steal, but, well, in this situation, it's okay. 
So, it, tolerance of people's behavior, even if it is 100% wrong. Our societies tell you, you can't say that that's wrong. We have whitewashed and sanitized even the way we talk about sin. We don't lie. We stretch the truth. We don't commit adultery. We have an affair. We don't commit fornication. If you don't know what fornication is, that's the, the biblical word for sex outside of the boundaries of marriage. Okay? We don't even say that that is sin because, well, everybody's doing it. In fact, if you're not doing that before you get married, well, you're a prude. True. Society has taken what God's Word clearly has taught is sinful behavior and it has made it acceptable in our society. And that's why we're going to spend some time this morning on this topic. Because it appears that our culture has forgotten what the book says. And I can tell you, as I said at the beginning, this is a hard message to preach. Because for anybody to stand up here and share this message, we all know who that, whoever it is, they are a sinner. It's true, we are all sinners. And so for anyone to stand up and say, hey, we're going to point out and talk about sin, it's easy to say, oh, man, who does he think he is? He thinks he's got it all together. He's so much better. No, listen, I stand before you a sinner saved by grace and nothing else. This was a hard message. Um, and I think, you know, the Apostle Paul said this of himself. Uh, among sinners, you put a group of sinners together, I'm the chief. That's what the Apostle Paul said. And I think if the Apostle Paul thought that he was chief among the sinners... Where does that put John Keck? Where, where, where does that put us? But Paul, who considered himself chief among the sinners, still preached the truth of God's Word. And so even in my imperfections, I feel compelled to do the same. So today I want to talk about three cultural misbeliefs about sin. And look at what did God really say. The first one is this. I'm not bad. I'm not a bad person. You're not a bad person. Well, I do make some mistakes from time to time. But I'm not a bad person. And the reality is, and we do not like to hear this, that is not a true statement. 1 John chapter 1, verses 8 and 10. Okay, I'm skipping a verse. We'll come back to it at the end. If we claim we have no sin, we are only fooling ourselves and are not living in the truth. Verse 10. If we claimed we have not sinned, we are calling God a liar and showing that His Word has no place in our hearts. Can I tell you how we get around this in our society? We just look around until we find somebody. Oh, there he is. No, there's nobody there. Okay, There he is, the guy that's worse than me. <laughs> that's what we do. We just find somebody who's doing worse than... Oh, look at the things that that guy does. At least I'm not as bad as him. I'm not a bad guy. You want to see a bad guy? That's a bad guy. Well, the problem is, with that always, is that there's not another human being on this planet who is your standard for living. No one. There's not another person on this planet. Seven, over seven billion people now. There's not one that we look to who is our standard. Our standard is God Himself. And when we, each of us, stand before a holy and perfect God, we all come up short. Oh. Somehow, I think we have, we have 
had the thought that God's going to grade us on the curve. How many remember when you were in school? Okay, I had a teacher in college that was known as C. Harris. His name was Charles, but the C did not stand for Charles. Okay, he gave one A, one F, two Bs, two Ds, and everybody else got a C. That was his bell curve. Whoever did the best got the A. Whoever did the worst, you could get an 80%. And if you were the worst, you got an F. And that, how, yeah, you want to hear college kids scream? This was the guy. Okay? Two Bs. Two Ds. You could get a 90%. And if you were in the bottom three, you, you, it wasn't that way because he gave hard tests. But... Whoever, those next two, you, you, you just got a D. Everybody else got a C. We're just kind of all lumped together. And I think some of us think, okay, you know what? Adolf Hitler, that's an F. And boom, we got him way over there. And then we say, well, there's the Mother Teresa or whoever. Okay, she's a saint. Boy, she's right there. And we're okay being lumped in the middle. I'm okay. You're okay. We're all Okay. God doesn't grade us on the curve. And when we compare ourselves to Him, Scripture says no one is righteous. No, not one. Everyone has sinned and falls short of God's glorious standard. Paul makes that very clear in Romans 3. We are all sinners. We are sinful in the eyes of God. The second cultural misbelief about sin is that all sin is the same. Now I'm gonna cl- I need to clarify this because some of you are saying, that's right, all sin is the same. Well, the Bible does not teach that all sin is the same. We have t- probably taught that. Well, it doesn't matter what sin. Okay, but, but it, here, here's who we talk about. All unforgiven sin leads to eternal death. The wages of sin is death. What do we deserve for sin? Eternal death, eternal separation from God. Okay, we rejoice in the last part of that verse. But the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. But all unforgiven sin leads to eternal death doesn't mean that all sin is the same. Okay, if, if uh, I decided to pick on someone, Tyler's standing up over there, so I'm going to pick on him right now. Okay, so if I decide that after church today, I see Tyler here and he's hanging out, and I just decide, oh boy, you know what, I'm going to let him have it. And I decide to just call Tyler a bad name. Now, hopefully you would know I would never do this. Okay? But let's let's just say that, man, I call him a bad name. Is Is that wrong of me? Yes. That would be sinful for me to do. Now, what if I took it a step further and I just, I see that he's walking away from me and he doesn't stand a chance and I just run and I do this flying karate thing. Now, you know that I can't do that either. Okay? (laughs) All fictitious. Okay, but I do this flying karate thing and hit him square in the back and knock him down and I just start pounding on him. How many know that would be wrong for me to do? Okay? What if I just pulled out a gun and shot him? No, those are awful things, all three of them. What would be worse? Calling him names? Which, Tyler's probably going to hear me say those names and he's going to go, Pastor John, sticks and stones. (laughs) Sticks and stones can break my bones, but your words will never harm me. Okay? Hopefully he would say that. Okay? If I beat him up... That'd be a little worse than calling him names. And if I just flat out shot him and killed him, that would be even worse. Which one would have worse ramifications for me? Calling him names or shooting him dead? Hopefully we see this. Can you see this? Okay? I'm using drastic because I want you to get it. Okay? 
In Luke chapter 20, Jesus was talking about the Pharisees, the religious leaders of the day. And he says, you Pharisees, you devour widows' houses. Now somehow, in the process of, they were supposed to be taking care of the widows. And somehow, they would take control of their property and that they would profit from it and they were hurting the widows. You're devouring. It's like, and Jesus calls them out on it. Hey, this is wrong. Here's what he says about it. He says, they will be severely punished. You know what that implies to me? That for some of our sins, we will be severely punished. Which means, for some sins, maybe not quite severely. There's a... Now, I don't know what God's scale is. I, I have no idea. I know as a parent that when I'm disciplining a child and I'm disciplining for calling names, I'm doing that different than I am if they start beating up another kid. Okay? My discipline is not always the same. It's based on behavior. And so it implies that some actions that we take are going to have more severe punishment. Jesus said to Pontius Pilate in John 19, So the one that handed you or handed me over to you, he's speaking about Judas Iscariot, he says, The one that handed me over to you, he has the greater sin. Jesus said that, hey, this guy has a greater sin than you. So somehow God is saying there are levels of degrees of sin. There's lesser sins. There's greater sins. In fact, when the Apostle Paul comes along and, and much of the New Testament is written by the Apostle Paul, uh, when Paul comes to the area of talking about sin, he's the one that says, stand strong, stand firm. Okay? But when he comes to sexual temptation, sexual immorality, Here's what he says. He has this, it's like he pulls him aside and has this special conversation. He does this in several places. This is just one place. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. He says, run from sexual sin. No other sin so clearly affects the body as this one does. For sexual immorality is a sin against your own body. So some sin, he says, you stand firm. You stand against it. Resist the devil. He will flee from you. Comes to sexual sin, don't even hang out. Run. Get away from it. Okay? There's different consequences to sexual sins than there are other sins. Okay? Fight. Resist. Not this one. Run, Forrest! Run! Because this one impacts us differently. And Paul knew that. So he addresses it differently. All unforgiven sin separates us from God. But there are certain sins on earth that will have a greater impact on our lives. Not only on this earth, but for eternity. How we live, what we do, it matters. It matters on earth. It matters in eternity. The last one, the third cultural misbelief. Well, since I've already done it, I might as well keep on doing it. Well, I lied, and nobody caught on. I got away with it, and it kept me out of trouble. You know what that makes me want to do? Tell another lie. I stole something and I didn't get caught. I, I, I've taken drugs. I, I've done alcohol. And, and it's not, there's no problem. For students, it might be, well, I cheated on homework or I cheated on a test and I got away with it. For an adult, it might be, well, last year I cheated on my taxes and didn't claim that. It might be, well, I'm not a virgin anymore, so... See, whatever the sin we have committed, we, we seem to want to justify it and say, well, I've already done it, so I might as well continue. 
And evidently this issue was going on back in that first century. Because the Apostle Paul said in Romans chapter 6, Well then, should we keep on sinning so that God can show us more and more of His wonderful grace? He's saying, God's going to forgive us, so why should we stop? Shouldn't we just keep on sinning so God has a greater opportunity to show how good He is? And Paul says, he answers himself and says, Of course not. Since we have died to sin, how can we continue to live in it? It's asking the question, how can we continue to do what hurts the heart of God? It hurts our own lives. And it hurts the people around us. Should we keep sinning so that God can show us more and more of His wonderful grace? Of course not. We know better than that. And if we didn't know that, now we do. I'm going to invite Christy to come back to the piano. I want, I want you to hear this as we wrap up. The last thing I want to do is to ever stand before you and make you think that I'm perfect. Many of you know that I, I, I've shared the story from when I was a kid. I, I had a pastor from the time I was in second grade through uh, graduating high school who was a wonderful, wonderful pastor. He's since gone on to be with, with the Lord. But the one thing, when, when I was in college... I figured something out about my pastor. I figured out that he wasn't perfect. All of my life I had watched my pastor and thought, wow, he's perfect. I never heard him share, not one time did I hear him share that he struggled with anything. I never heard him say, wow, I blew it. It was as if he always, always, had everything together perfectly. And it wasn't until I was in college and, was, and he was no longer my pastor and had moved on that I began to see, wow, he's just a real person. Same as everybody else. He wasn't perfect. He had struggles. And I made a decision early on in my ministry that I, I, I did not want to do that. I never wanted to stand before people and say, hey, you know what? I have got this all together. I don't ever struggle with any of that. I don't ever say the wrong thing. Some of you have known me long enough. Well, you already know this. I'm anything but perfect. I'm a man with all of the sinful desires of every other man that has ever walked this planet. All of the shortcomings that we possess of being a part of the human race. And there's been countless times when I have failed. I've shared this several times, but when I was in high school, and I, had, I was 15 when I really committed my, my life to Christ, felt called into ministry and began that journey and, and yet I still struggled with things in my life. And somehow I thought, well, you know what? When I graduate from high school, then I'll reach that, that I'll, be, I'll, be, you know, I'll be perfect then. And I graduated from high school and made my way into college and Bible college and thought, man, I'm at Bible college now. I'm never going to have to struggle with sin now. And yet I found myself still struggling with my human condition. And I thought, you know what, when I graduate from Bible college, somehow when I have that degree in my hand, then that, that perfection will come. And I graduated and my, still struggled. Went to my first church and thought, man, I'm going to take, I'm, gonna, I'm, a, I'm a pastor now. I'm a youth pastor. I made it. There'll be no more struggles for me. 
But come to find out, there's still struggles when you're a youth pastor or a children's pastor. You know what? When I get married, that will take care of the situation. And we got married. And still, imperfection. If I have a kid and I become a dad, oh, I had four kids and stayed imperfect. See, there's something in us that we just, we just want to we want to get it right. We, we want to be perfect. We, we want to, we hear that, be perfect as I am perfect. And we say, yeah, that, that, that's it. But can I tell you, until we step on heaven's shore, there will always be things that we struggle with. And you know, we, I find that as I'm getting older, there are some things that I don't struggle with like I did when I was younger. Maybe you've experienced some of that. But you know, the enemy always has a way that when I stop struggling with one thing, he finds something else for me to struggle with. There's always me looking for that moment of, okay, I want to be perfect, but I'm not. But can I tell you that I am a person who am, is thankful that God loves me enough to shine the light of His Holy Spirit upon my life. And I'm convinced that the closer that we get to Jesus, the closer we get to that light. And the more light that we have of Him shining upon our life, the more that we recognize how much darkness has been there. How many have figured out from life that sin has a way of growing? You lie about a little thing and it seems that that little lie just grows and grows. You steal something small and you get away with it and the items get bigger and bigger. We, we cheat on something small when we're a kid and we find ourselves cheating on big things in work and life. See, sin always takes us further than we will be wanting to go. And it will always cost us more than we want to pay. Earlier I shared from 1 John chapter 1, verses 8 and 10. If we claim we have no sin, we are only fooling ourselves and we're not living in the truth. If we claim we have not sinned, we are calling God a liar and showing that His Word has no place in our hearts. But the verse that's sandwiched in between those is the verse... That is my hope. But if we confess our sins to Him, He is faithful and He's just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all wickedness, all unrighteousness. That verse is the hope of this sinner. First Corinthians chapter 10, the Apostle Paul says, Hey, John Keck, the temptations of your life are no different than from what others have experienced. And God is faithful. He will not allow the temptation to be more than you can stand. And when you are tempted, He will show you a way out so that you can endure it doesn't matter what we may be trapped in. It may, doesn't matter how long we've been there. It doesn't matter if we think we can ever overcome it. Scripture is clear that God gives us a way out of temptation. Jesus is the way out. He's the way out of sin. He's also the truth. The the truth that will set us free. He's also the life, the only life that will ever satisfy. And when we are tempted, we need to get into that place where the first thought, the, the thing, the mechanism that goes off in our head is that God is faithful. God is faithful. He will always give us a way out. And even when our culture says it's okay, it doesn't matter what you do, 
We can hear that and recognize it for what it is. That is a lie. It is a lie from the pit of hell itself. And I close with this last thought. That we remember. Sin is the greatest enemy there is to our relationship, to us having intimacy with God. And we can be grateful that Jesus was known as a friend of sinners. Now you think about that phrase, friend of sinner. It was used not as a good term, it was derogatory. When the Pharisees saw Jesus going and hanging out with sinners, they said, oh, look at him. He's a friend of those sinners. It was not a good thing. But can I tell you, for me, it's a good thing. And it doesn't mean Jesus is a friend of sinners, so come and just come and you can hang out in your sinfulness. It's not what it means. Jesus is a friend of sinners who takes us right where we are at but doesn't leave us there. He says, come. I'll forgive you for those sins. And I will give you a new life, an abundant life that will take you through this life into eternity with me forever. Jesus, friend of sinner, led people to salvation and freedom from their sin. And we can run to the Father. I didn't ask Christy to pick this song this morning, but man, how fitting. And we're going to sing it again as we close today that we run to the Father again and again and again. If you want, if you can stand, you can sit, I don't care. But I just want us to make this place an altar today as we sing this song and ask Angel, can we get those words back up if at all possible? I was reading this morning uh, in 2 Timothy. I read the entire book of 2 Timothy this morning and I came across this in, in chapter 1. It says, For God saved us and called us to live a holy life. He did this not because we deserve it, but because that was His plan from the beginning of time to show us His grace through Jesus Christ. When the Apostle Paul struggled with the whatever was his thorn in the flesh, God spoke to him and said, My grace is sufficient for you for my power is made perfect in your weakness man my life has the opportunity to show God's power your weaknesses have the opportunity to show God's power I want us to take just a moment as we sing this to just lay this before the Lord have a conversation with him before we leave this place today.
today, we simply run to you. You are our God, the God of that created this universe that desires relationship with you. And today we know that you desire to be with us. And so we run to you. Father, if there is anything in our lives in this moment, we confess it. Anything that separates us from you, we confess it as sin, knowing you are faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us in this moment and restore that, renew that relationship to give us that fresh start today. So, Father, I pray for each one that is here and each one that is watching that, Father, this will be a week. Father, a week of of walking in your victory. And, Father, if it means that every day we turn and we run to you, that's what we need. We declare our dependency upon you. Everything in our world teaches us to be dependent Uh, to, to to be not dependent to be our own person but Father today we declare that the most mature thing we can do as a follower of you is to say Lord we are dependent upon you we know that screams against our culture we know that is against the way most of us were raised but Father we declare our dependency on you that you are our everything and today I pray that you will speak to us and that throughout this week you will continue to let this word get into our hearts and into our lives and it would find good soil and it would grow there and produce a good harvest in our lives that our actions our words they matter And it doesn't matter what society is saying. We are not taking our cues from them. We are not taking our cues from social media. We are taking our cues from your word. The word that we can stand upon. That we can base our life upon. That it is the authoritative guide. The instruction for our lives. Father, I pray your blessing now upon each one, upon each family. I pray, Father, give us a great week of serving in your kingdom. May we be found faithful sharing the good news of Jesus with those we come into contact with. May we be faithful in digging into your word, reaching in and growing in our walk with you. May we be found encouraging one another within the body of Christ. Father, do something in our hearts and our lives to make us more like you. That is our desire. Father, I pray, go with us now in the strong name of Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Well, it's after 10 and it's dark out so god bless you hey thank you for being here today Uh, i'm going to suggest you get to your cars before it starts to pour oh all right have a great day we love you